Hey, hi there. Um, Bob, Two Old Guys Garage. This is uh, my 32 coupe uh, clutch hydraulic slave cylinder redo, part six, segment one. It is July 10th. What I did this morning is I drilled out the two, two holes where the uh, two brake lines are going to come off the clutch slave cylinder. And I'm going to put the bell housing back on temporarily and see how the hoses fit. So I'm going to pause, be back in a second. Hi, back after the pause, checking the fit. Uh, the top one is the bleed screw. And now that I look at it, I see that when this thing moves up, that's a little bit tight angle on this hose. So what I might do is put a hole up higher so that this has more of a straight through. That'll leave this as a, as a spare hole. <laughs> oh well. Uh, thinking about it. Oh yeah, I took the pivot ball for the uh, manual clutch fork out since it would be kind of in the way not usable and this was the blocking plug for the left hand side that wasn't used I had to unstuck this to uh, put a uh, endoscope video camera in there and take a look around so we're going to glue that back in that'll go on the left side and wherever the right side is, somewhere around here. Oh, here it is. Oh, this is the stock right side. I'll leave this open so that I got a way to come in on this side with the uh, endoscope to check things. All right, so. That's it. Um, that should be the end of a very short segment one. Catch you all later. Bye. Ah, back. <clears throat> Drilled a third hole, and that's going to work out pretty good. As you can see, this is this is against the stop, which is where it will be when it's running. The 90 degree fitting on the bleeder which is at the top where it should be it comes to that forward hole which will go somewhere to the firewall where the bleeder screw will be accessible so I got a third hole that I don't need I'm going to try to plug the two using holes with rubber grommets and uh, I'll just probably use some sort of a conventional plug to uh, do that mistaken not used there at all. Anyway, that's it. This is really the end of this segment, and I'll catch you later. Take care. Hi there, Bob from the Two Old Guys Garage. It's 7 11 2024. This is part six, segment two of converting my T10 transmission to a hydraulic slave cylinder. This is pretty much set. I got the holes where I want them. The holes that I don't want to have been plugged and bell housing has been cleaned where the bolts go and I'm about ready to put that back in and do a very precise depth measurement uh, so that I can carry on with uh, making sure that the uh, shim adjustment is optimized for the bearing to the claw of fingers. Throw out fingers. It's all right. Oh, a little hot, a little sweaty. What I've been working on this morning is getting the Willwood master cylinder for the new clutch in, in, in place. <clears throat> and what I've done is um, they take a 5 16 hole. The back hole is 5 16 The front hole is slotted to allow me to rotate, pivot on the back bolt and get the optimum angle of a twist rod uh, because it does go through an arc. And I wanted it centered from when it's in the uh, full back position. It seems to be okay. I think I'm through drilling on that. Uh, gonna, gonna knock, 
knock that off. Uh, let's see. Oh, just a little bit of history if anybody's interested. I'm going to talk about that particular bolt right there. This car was running, registered, inspected, and insured in Massachusetts, Lynn, Massachusetts, in 1955 as a completely stock 32 Ford 5 window coupe. <clears throat> Johnny Ryan bought it, paid $200 for it, and then and started tearing it all apart. Well, he cut the body off the frame, modified the frame, it's been boxed all the way from the firewall back, Zed, seed, so on and so forth, and then tubular cross members put into the rear, and a K cross member put into the center, as you can see, that's the K. Now those pads right there are pads to fit a 46 Lincoln O'Day overdrive transmission. And when I put the T10 in, what I did was I adapted those existing pads by supporting a U-channel, bolting it in, and you can see the wear marks, those two holes right there for the T10 rear mount. And that worked out pretty good. So, the bolt. When I bought the car, the car was abandoned in 1957 after two years of work. And the reason was is that that gang, all of the gang was 18 thereabouts and of draft age, and all of them got drafted, including John, the owner of the coupe. John, however, had a heart problem and he was rejected, so he was all his own, and he just basically lost interest. So when I got the car in June of 60, a couple things stood out that really bothered me, bear in mind that I was a mechanic for years at that time working on foreign cars. These uh, hairpins were made, however, at this point, right here, there was custom separate clevises, handmade clevises chromed. They were tiny, 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 and they were held as one piece here on the bottom and on the top with quarter inch 20 grade two bolts. Well, you don't have to be a genius to figure out that's not gonna work. Well, I didn't want to remake the crevices at that time, so I went to my good friend, Gary Stella, who was in the Navy out of South Weymouth Naval Air Station. And he was an AR, which is an aircraft reciprocating engine. That meant in those days he was the guy that tore apart engines on Corsairs and Hellcats. Yeah, a long time ago. Anyway, when they tear an engine apart in the Navy, maybe they do it elsewise in aviation, they do not reuse the same bolts. The bolts and nuts that come off are thrown into a trash bin. And uh, uh, basically they put new bolts in. So I told him my problem with the quarter inch 20 and he went into the trash bin and he grabbed a bucket full of bolts and I ended up drilling the quarter 20 single arms here to 5 16ths and putting aircraft quality bolts with nylock nuts. And that lasted for a while, a couple of years, more than a couple of years. But eventually, I didn't like it, and then I, PSI, I think these were in Paramount, California, I bought the bat wings, and I bought the mill spec open clevises, and as you can see, these are pretty hefty bolts. That took care of that problem, because one of the pieces kept breaking. So, the aircraft bolts that my friend Gary got me in 1960, that's one of them right there. That aircraft boat was used uh, to, you know, since 1960. So every time I look at it, I think of my, my friend Gary, who has been gone for quite a while, passed on, like most of my friends. Anyway, that's a little story. As old as this car is, there's a lot of stories. Anyway, I hope that didn't bore you. Uh, I'm about to end this. I think that's enough for now. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Hey. The other thing that I was mentioning besides the <clears throat> quarter 20 bolts on the hairpin points was that all the brake lines were in and they were all quarter inch copper, single flared. That wasn't going to work either. So that was one of the first jobs I did was replaced it with steel double flared brake lines. Okay.
Hi there, Bob from the Two Old Guys Garage in my garage. Today is July 13th, 2024. This is uh, part six, segment three of the long, seems to be running, change to the clutch hydraulic slave cylinder and the T10 transmission. Getting there. Okay, so here's what happened yesterday. Uh, the bell housing is ready. With all the holes and places, and uh, as you can see, it's bolted in with the new grade 8 bolts, torqued. And then, uh, let's see, the uh, Willwood slave cylinder has been mounted and is adapted, and the push rod's been made. So we're ready to go on that part. And then this part, which looks kind of crummy. This is the K cross member. I took everything and degreased it, washed it, and painted and primed. And then that, uh, those two holes there in the center are for the rear T10 transmission mount. And I put all new hardware, new lock washes and stuff. Uh, haven't tightened the bolts yet, but that'll come probably tomorrow. Then the other thing was today... This morning I worked on the transmission. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, on the bell housing, I did take some uh, very uh, precise measurements a number of times for the depth of the uh, curl pairing to the uh, clearance to the clutch fingers on the, on the clutch pressure plate. And I noted that they weren't all even, so I took the highest one or the one closest to the bearing towards the rear and used that as my guide and took measurements a couple of times using a tri-square and then scribing marks and then measuring the marks for this side and the other side. And I got about 103 to 105 thousandths, which uh, one shim gives me uh, that 105 and the spec from the speed wave bearing says 50 thousandths to 100 thousandths, so I think I'm going to go with the one shim. Now, then this morning, I had thought I was going to take the Hearst Competition Plus shifter apart, but I looked on YouTube at a couple of videos that did that. Oh, no, I don't think so. I'm not going to mess with that. It's not in that bad a shape. So what I ended up doing was cleaning it with alcohol, all the surfaces that I could reach, and then lubing everything that I could reach with the uh, the German spline heavy molly concentration. And then I put the, uh, the three shift rods on the back end, have all the new bushings and lubed up. Then I worked uh, on the uh, attachment plate, checked all the bolts, Replaced one bolt where the threads weren't deep enough. Made sure there was lock washers that cleared everything. And then on this guy here, this thread in here is 3 h thread is gone. This is drilled through and it gets a through bolt which puts it down. And there's all new grade 8 hardware on that. So the last thing I have to do in the transmission before it's ready to go is to take and put the new steel bushings and clips and grease and lube on the front part. Except for that... It's ready to go. Also, I put the, the new motor mount, rear motor mount, excuse me, rear transmission mount on the tail shaft of the transmission. So the next step after I finish the front linkage on the shifting rods is that it's ready to go in. And I just talked to Lou. I'm going to borrow his small floor hydraulic jack because I certainly can't lift a 100-pound transmission and juggle it. Uh, I have determined that this will fit through the bell housing hole at the back and then at the same time I'll feed these through the two holes. And then it's a question of uh, you know juggling it so it goes together. And before I do that I'll, I'll uh, take a Q-tip and I'll make sure that the splines on both the clutch disc and the pilot shaft, these guys, uh, are lubricated with the spline grease. Not heavily, but enough to where it should work okay. So that's about that. I just talked to Lou. He is 
He's gathered some parts for the hinge, hinging of the doors, and he's got the parts in. There's shims for the hinges that we found at McMaster Car, and then there's um, he goes into wood on the fiberglass body to tie the hinge down to the body side from the door. And uh, we looked up and we got 5 16 stainless steel uh, screws that we'll use to go into the wood. So he's got that. What he's doing right now is, is he's trying to repair his lathe, which has had a problem for some time with the, uh, there's an overload that trips apparently, it's too sensitive. He said he's got tired of pushing it. His button's got a callus on it. So he's trying to find a replacement part for that. One part he got didn't work. It was a bad one, so he's still doing that. So he's kind of laying back, and we'll get back to that one of these days. So anyway, that brings me up to the end of uh, this segment. I think I've covered everything. Uh, slow but sure. It's looking good. Getting there. Um, I was fortunate yesterday morning uh, I got a good day in because uh, it was maybe 10 degrees cooler than its usual high 90 stuff but there it is there it is okay everybody take care appreciate you catch you later